Welcome to this edition of Human Cyber Risk Awareness Month with Hawks Hunt. We might have saved the best for last, because this is truly an all-star panel of experts. In this edition, we'll talk about the current state of social engineering and its future. I'll go ahead and introduce everyone one by one, and then we'll turn it over to the experts. So first off, with us, we have Petri Kwibala. Petri is CISO advisor at Hawks Hunt. He was the first CISO of Nokia and established the CISO function NXP Semiconductors. He has been a core part of Microsoft, Qualcomm, and several other companies' cybersecurity functions. Petri is one of the pioneers of the CISO profession. He established regular board reporting processes long before that became a thing. He's run human risk reduction programs before the term was widely used, and he's faced off against nation-state attackers. Petri, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Elliot. And next up is Maxime Cartier. Maxime is a human risk management leader who has built security awareness, behavior, and culture change programs for several global companies, such as H&M Group. His goal is to help people stay safe online and support organizations who make the switch from raising awareness to changing behaviors. He's currently an advisor at Hawks Hunt. Hi, Maxime. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Elliot. And hi, everyone. I'm really looking forward to the session. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Great to have you here. And that brings us to our featured guest, Dr. Jessica Barker, who we are truly thrilled and honored to have join us. Dr. Jessica Barker, MBE, is an award-winning leader in the human side of cybersecurity and has delivered face-to-face -face awareness sessions to over 50,000 people. Jessica is the go-to expert for media such as BBC, Sky News, and Wired, and she has delivered over 80 keynotes, including NATO, the World Government Summit, and RSA. She serves on numerous boards, including the UK Government Cybersecurity Advisory Board. She is author of the best-selling book, Confident Cybersecurity, amongst other books. And in June 2023, Jessica was awarded an MBE, which I find to be really incredible. It's the member of the Order of the British Empire for services to cybersecurity by King Charles in his first birthday honors. And we are honored to have you here, Dr. Barker. That's very kind. Thank you so much. It's great to be here with you all. And just one more word on the MBE award, because I think it's really telling about the impact of Jessica's work and the way she's helped cybersecurity awareness enter global consciousness. The member of the Order of the British Empire is awarded for, as I understand it, an outstanding achievement or service to the community, which has had a long-term significant impact. So with that, Let's get started and let's turn it over to the experts. Let's start with Jessica. Dr. Barker, can you take us from the beginning? What is social engineering and why does it work so well? Yeah, great to start with that definition to get us all on the same page. Essentially, social engineering is the manipulation of people, getting us to do something that we wouldn't or shouldn't ordinarily. That might be click a link, download an attachment, transfer money or share information. And cyber criminals use often psychological tricks to do this. The Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report of this year has found that pretexting is being used by social engineers, by cyber criminals, more than plain phishing. So essentially, they're using more of these tricks. They're building more of these narratives to manipulate us. And it's important we're all aware that the right fish at the wrong time can catch any of us. And this is because phishing, social engineering, subverts our trust, a natural human emotion that has helped us evolve as a species. And it also manipulates the way we process information. So clouding our judgment, pushing us into thinking quickly, meaning that we are operating emotionally and impulsively, and therefore we are more likely to before we give ourselves time to think and process whether we really should be clicking that link or whether something looks untoward. Thank you for that, Dr. Barker. That's a very clear explanation of it. And you mentioned pretexting in the Verizon DBIR. What other trends have you seen in social engineering in 2023? That really, I think the pretexting really hints at some of the trends we're seeing. Cyber criminals have realized that we are we're having some success and it's important to acknowledge that on the awareness side, on the human side of cybersecurity, we have helped people be more savvy to phishing emails. And so cybercriminals have had to up their game. 
they have evolved to using more pretexting, so using more sophisticated fishing, and they've also evolved their methods. So we still see plain fishing. We still see, you know, very unsophisticated attempts, and we still see lots of phishing emails. It's still the most common method, but we have seen a broadening out of the methods being used by cyber criminals. So we're seeing more phishing over WhatsApp, more phishing over social media, over text messages, over phone calls. And we've seen this in recent news, you know, allegedly, according to the group that seems to be behind the MGM attack, of course, that began with a phishing phone call. So cyber criminals have upped their game. They've realized that they can't just send those plain fishes anymore and expect the rate of success that they had in the past because we have become more savvy and we've had success in helping people be more aware, practice more secure behaviors, spot untoward emails and communications. Cyber criminals have really broadened out and evolved their methods. The game is definitely changing. It's really expanding. And I think you really touched on a couple of those, those kind of breaches from phishing, including the MGM attack with that voice component to it, so-called vishing. And Petri Quivala, is there a any other kind of trends you've seen in fishing in 2023 that you think you're particularly concerned or, you know, think merits some attention? Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, just saying that Jessica, well, absolutely a kind of wonderful list. Uh, it's really difficult to add anything uh, on, on top of that, but uh, let me even anyway try. So you, you mentioned that right fish can get any one of us at the right time. The thing is that, that that's exactly true. And on my opinion, what the industry is starting to realize slowly is that it shouldn't be actually the main problem. We should be capable of actually building the safety networks where the rest of us is helping you to save the day for someone who made the mistake. It shouldn't ever be a kind of catastrophic issue if one person makes a mistake being a human being. We all do those. From the technical side point of view, of course, as, as you, Jessica, said, it's more targeted. The messages are not anymore containing any of the kind of obvious telltale signs of the phishing. And it's clear that the other side is really preparing much better. Of course, there is the, the, the regular guys who are, who are still using the, the uh, low sophisticated messages, but that's, that's not many any, anymore of them. And, and that's where we need to actually up our game as well on the, on the other side. We need to tap much more into the human psychology, helping people to build uh, a kind of cyber judgment. Yeah, a lot of good points there, Petri. Thanks for that. And we've talked about the problem a bit. And also we should mention that the problem as a business problem is to the tunes of hundreds of billions of, you know, whether it's euros, pounds or dollars per year, you can exchange the currency because it's all it's a huge problem. And not to mention the lives it can actually ruin. but I want to talk a little bit about the solution and Petri, maybe we'll stay with you on this question. How do we combat phishing? You've been doing this for a long time. You've been shaping information security functions for decades mm. as a CISO. So given what you and Jessica have already said, what advice would you give to InfoSec leaders who are trying to protect their people against these increasingly targeted attacks? Yep. I, I think that when we are looking into the industry overall, the industry has not got it right from the beginning. But there are certain companies who are capable of doing what it takes to change the human behavior, what it takes to actually really build this sort of cyber chargement to the heads of the people where they are intuitively capable of recognizing that if the context of a message is correct or not. Because that's at the end of the day what it is all about, Re realizing the context in a nanosecond and then if the context is not matching, then actually looking a bit deeper that what the heck is this message all about. But it starts really from uh, uh, realizing the fact that every one of us will make mistakes. Uh, so we need to build as large population around us who are capable of then reporting the cases when they come through uh, the different uh, protection mechanisms or so, so that it doesn't really make a kind of major difference if one person makes the mistake or so. And it, it, it uh, kind of must be built on top of the uh, human psychology. And I think that Maxime, for example, is going to talk about that later a bit more. But kicking in the uh, production of the dopamine makes you to conditionalize your behavior that you did when you were doing uh, the positive thing uh, that you were rewarded for. Uh, without going any deeper, I, I guess I, I'll leave it here. 
Well, yeah, that's a great jumping off point. I think this is a good time to bring Maxime into the conversation here. I did just want to say that I love the term cyber judgment because the idea of having instincts and habits, we didn't exactly grow up, evolve from the jungle to spot a phishing attack. So it's not really a natural thing for us to do. So it's great having experts like yourself as you voted to helping ingrain those types of judgments and habits and instincts into us. So Maxime, you have a long track record of leading awareness programs, very very successful ones. What are the keys to executing a successful security awareness and behavior change program? We could say a lot about this. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Elliot. Since this is a panel about the state of social engineering, I'll focus on phishing simulations because what's funny about them is that on one end, you have some people who swear by them. And on the other, you have people who are passionate about telling that they don't work. And the truth is that I mean, phishing simulation, they're neither fundamentally good or bad. They're a tool and it's the way you do them that matters. So the first key to execute a successful phishing simulation program is that the simulation should be at the right difficulty level and they should start easy, even very easy. You can start with an email that says, Hey, I'm a phishing simulation is what the report suspicion button looks like and click on it and report me and reward people for doing the right thing for the first time. That's when you have that dopamine kick, right? And you need to start easy, to start tiny, as BJ Fogg puts it. And then over time, the simulations can become more and more difficult so that people can progress and learn about more advanced attack. Ideally, you want each simulation that an individual receives to be selected based on their skill level, because if the simulations are too difficult, people will feel it get frustrated. And if they're too easy, it can also feel frustrating and it doesn't promote learning. So there's a rule actually by Robert uh, Wilson that says that optimal learning happens when individuals are correct about 85% of the time. So that's what we can, you know, try to strive for, for learning. But then the biggest complaint I hear or read about is that we shouldn't do phishing simulations because that's tricking people. So first, that means that having them at the right level of difficulty matters. And the other thing is that the simulation should be aligned or selected with your company culture in mind. For some and perhaps most organizations, it's just not okay to send simulation promising benefits or salary raises, especially in times of slow economic growth or recession. Uh, so simulations that create very strong emotional reactions might destroy trust and psychological safety, which means, you know, at best people won't like you, they won't like security. At worst, it might impact people's well-being at work and their productivity, uh, your business in the end. So. I understand the reaction there, HR and benefit simulations in particular, they should be used with a lot of restriction. Uh, but one way to still use them if you want to train your people about it is to make them part of a special challenge, a spicy mode, where people are warned that there will be difficult training emails causing strong reactions and that they have to opt in or register for that. Because then they've taken an active decision to participate and they're committed to learn. And just one final point, uh, the training program also needs to be continuous for the IAB to stay top of mind and it needs to be positive. So the focus, I think, should be on rewarding people who report simulations and learn about them rather than on punishing people who click. As we all know, we talked about it, that the click rate will never go down to zero. And Jessica, I love when you say the right fish at the wrong time can catch anyone. So instead of focusing on the clicks, we should focus on getting as many people as possible to report anything suspicious. That's when you get the real value, when your SOC is getting reports about the real threats and when they get them fast because people got into the habit of report. So phishing is still the number one human risk. We cannot just ignore it. That's why in my opinion, phishing simulations are an important tool and we need to use it to train employees to detect and report uh, these attacks in a way that feels positive, useful, and fair. Thank you for that answer, Maxime. I really appreciate it because it, it is nuanced. There, it's, there are shades of gray to this whole discussion. And that question of trust when you're trying to figure out if you're doing something that's consequence-based versus reward-based, are you doing something that has a positive versus a negative feel towards it? I think it goes into something that uh, you, Dr. Barker, have written about in addition to awareness is culture. What really is the idea of culture. What is culture compared to when we just talk about awareness? And what's the science that drives an effective behavior change program and cultural transformation? So culture um, is something that people often, I think, find confusing. It seems very intangible and hard to define, but we absolutely can 
get to grips with really what we mean by culture in a general sense, in an organizational sense, and of course, what we mean in terms of security. And for me, I understand um, cybersecurity culture and define it to be not just about awareness and behaviors, but also around values and perceptions. So ultimately, how do people feel about cybersecurity in the organization? Is it something that they think is important to them? Do they think it's important to the organization and leadership? You know, do they have that perception that it's a value that matters in the organization in general? How do they feel about the security team? You know, as Maxime said, do they feel that the security team is out to get them, you know, and is, is going to punish them if they click on something? Or do they feel that actually they will be recognized and rewarded if they practice positive security behaviors? It's a lot about how people also feel about themselves. So levels of self-efficacy. Do people feel capable of engaging in the behaviors that are being recommended, that are being you know, included in guidance and rules in the organization? Or do they feel, and it could be for multiple reasons, that actually they can't engage in those behaviors? They may feel that they haven't had the training. They may feel that the tools are not set up to help them. Or they may feel, for example, that the organizational values, such as around productivity, are at odds with what's being said in terms of security. And that can lead to workarounds. So it's really about digging underneath um, into what is happening, what are the norms, and what is feeding those. So if we look at Professor Edgar Schein, often seen as, you know, one of the founding fathers of organizational culture, he talks about the importance of underlying assumptions when it comes to really making up what the day-to-day -day organizational culture is. And we can look at the same in terms of security culture. What are those organizational assumptions, those underlying assumptions when it comes to security? And so there's lots of approaches that we can turn to when it comes to driving an effective behavior change program and culture transformation around cybersecurity. And I touch on them in uh, my book, Confident Cybersecurity, now in its second edition, I'm delighted to say, and the book I co-authored, Cybersecurity ABCs. So we can think about taking a systems approach to errors rather than pointing the finger at individuals, scapegoating individuals looking at actually the root causes behind what we would label human error. We can turn to behavioral economics, the way that people process information, what makes up a behavior, what leads to us practicing a certain behavior. And then we can look at principles of just culture, how we can build a just culture. For example, turning to uh, the aviation industry and great work that has been done there around um, safety culture. So what I'm kind of hinting at, there has luckily been a lot of work already done around driving culture change, around promoting and changing behaviors in a more positive direction. So as well as Professor Edgar Schein's work that I've already mentioned, um, as well as aviation safety culture, we can look at behavior models from experts like BJ Fogg, um, as Maxine mentioned, Nishi. So we can look at different behavior models and think about how we can utilize those. And I think the challenge that people have often in cybersecurity is we're so busy. Many people are on the front line responding to incidents or maybe working in more deeply technical roles that actually trying to pull all of this great information that's out there, trying to pull it together to be able to understand it in a practical sense can be challenging. And so that's why I recently published The Ultimate Guide to Cybersecurity Culture to really bring together all of this great work alongside my own experience working with organizations for the last 12 years or so on um, security awareness, behavior, and culture programs to help people actually understand where does this work all fit in and how can you use it on that day-to-day -day basis to actually drive a more positive and proactive security culture. Well, I would certainly recommend for everybody watching this to run out and grab Jessica's books. The ABCs of security security awareness you've really put into a very digestible, approachable format there. We'll link to those in the description of this webinar. So thank you for that, Jessica. And we are now 
into this phase of the conversation where we're trying to talk about when you're trying to transform culture, how do you do that? What are some of the really key things? And I think that some of the things I've heard before is that you need to be able to communicate the value of your program. You need to be able to demystify culture and take it out of that silo or that box that it might be in. And I'm going to open this up to the whole panel. So this seems like a question of metrics, of numbers. How do you affix numbers to some of these aspects, of cultural transformation, behavior change? So maybe Maxime, let's start with you. And are there any numbers or metrics that you think are particularly have been useful for you in your career? Yeah, so I like what Jessica said, that the fact that all people feel about security is important. So I usually categorize security culture metrics in three buckets, into three types of metrics. First one is, is attitudes, how people feel about security. Second one would be knowledge, what people know about security. And the third one, behavior, what people do if they take safe or unsafe decision. Usually you have security teams that focus on knowledge the most, along with uh, how many people they reach. But ideally you want to measure the three elements, right? Attitudes, knowledge, and behavior. And if you're a team of one and you cannot do everything, I would say forget about your reach metrics and focus on getting behavioral metrics instead. Because you'd rather know the number of employees who are using strong passwords rather than the number of employees who have watched a video about the importance of having strong passwords, right? So in practice, it means that first you need to identify what are your biggest risks and what are the behaviors that drive those risks. You check which of these behaviors you can measure. In the beginning, it won't be all of them. But for example, you can get insights into phishing clicking and reporting behaviors with your phishing simulations, or you can use different tools like a CASB to see if your employees are using unapproved cloud storage solutions. And measuring this behavior and following them over time is so important, I find, because they are a clear indicator of the impact of your actions. Uh, you can even, you know, try an action on a small group, on a pilot group, see what was the status in the beginning, the intervention, see if you have an impact compare, compared to a control group, have a bit of a scientific approach to that. Uh, this allows to consciously adapt your action, but that's also super useful, I find, to report to management. Because we have a problem where some CISOs tend to see security awareness as, well, not a very important topic, something that where the team is more entertainers or communicators rather than security practitioners who reduce risk. And the simple reality is that if you can show to your leaders that there was a risk, you know, you measured the baseline behavior, you've done a certain intervention and you've reduced that risky behavior, you reduce your risk. Well, I mean, that's when you win. I think that's when you get the support that you need to continue this program and to expand. Yeah, that's great, Maxime. Appreciate that answer. And I also, I think it's actually germane to the conversation to mention that you, you mentioned experiments and the power of experiments and you are a scientist by training. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm a chemical engineer by training. And actually you go into the behavior of people. So, I, but I think that's really cool. I think it's really an important thing too, is to look at that is that we're looking at people, but if you take that scientific approach towards it, as I think all, all three of you have done, uh, you're really looking at like how people can actually have their behavior change within this larger systematic scientific context. And so let's just sort of go around. I'm not sure who wants to volunteer next. Uh, Petri, do you have something on your, on your mind as far as uh, key metrics for there's communicating always, awareness? There is always something in the mind. Uh, this time it's key metrics, obviously. Uh, so what uh, Maxim said, attitude, knowledge, and the behavior, they are the core, in my opinion. How do we uh, engage them more? How many of them end up of being the role model uh, in the organization? How many of, of them will be the ambassadors in the network of the people? Beyond of that, of course, I would like to profile the different populations. How many still requires the uh, more knowledge and, and motivation? How many would do the correct thing if the security team would make it easy for them? I, I would like to understand uh, answers to those questions. And then that would enable me as a CISO to do much better kind of targeting of my medicine. Motivate them, make it easy. Love it. And Dr. Barker, any key metrics that you recommend your, your clients and the people who you talk to? Sure. I've loved hearing what Maxime and Petri have both said already. I think Petri's point of focusing on the positive rather than the negative is really important. 
insecurity, we can very much take that negative perspective, focus on the problems, but actually shining a light on the behaviors that you want can be far more impactful. So um, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the, the fact that people can really concentrate on click rate, and this can be a misleading metric, partly as Maxime said, you know, click rate will never be zero. So people are always going to click. And if you do get click rate in a phishing simulation, for me, that's a bit of a, a red flag and a bit of a red herring. It can lull you into a, a false sense of security. So instead, focus on report rate. How many people are reporting? How quickly are they reporting via the right channels? We can get much more rich data actually on the behavior that we want. So ultimately, then I think metrics, as Maxime said, you know, looking at pilot groups, looking at control groups, being able to take a more scientific approach can be really helpful. And people can often feel intimidated by metrics. We can often have this sense if we're thinking about metrics for a program of how can we have the perfect metrics to start with. And I always recommend for clients that actually they put some metrics in place. They keep track of them. They check back in on them. They review on them. And they get together as a team and see, are these the right metrics? What are they telling us? And once you start collecting some, you will then be in this process that will help you refine those. And maybe you'll find that you leave some to one side and you bring in different metrics as you go further down the road. But just starting that process can be really helpful. Ultimately, what I really love to see when it comes to metrics is an ability for the security team to actively listen to the rest of the organization. It's great to be able to look at the data to see how are people behaving. It can be helpful to run surveys and take a broad perspective over, you know, an idea of what people are doing. But ultimately, you want to get down to those underlying assumptions. You want to try and understand why. If people are practicing poor behaviors around passwords, why are they doing that? If people are using WhatsApp to communicate, um, you want to try and you know, find out if they're sharing sensitive data and you want to understand why. Is there a tension in place? Is there some friction that's stopping them sharing secure information in the way that you want? And so for me, if it's possible, running focus groups in an organization can be really beneficial for creating a space where people feel comfortable to talk about cybersecurity and where you can really dig into the why it can give you very rich qualitative data that you can then use to inform the quantitative data that might have come out from what's coming through the SOC or what you're getting through surveys. I love that. Start with why. Get that qualitative and match it with a quantitative. It, it takes a little bit of effort, but I, I really like that a lot. Okay. Uh, panel, this is about the, the end of our time here together, but there is one last question I wanted to ask everybody. I hope we all have time for it. And that is the future of social engineering. And we can go one by one round the horn here. Why don't we start with Petri and then to Maxime and then Jessica. And what do you see as the future of social engineering? The future, a uh, human will be staying as humans. There, there, there will always be new ones who needs to be uh, teached. And that's, of course, uh, the challenge and opportunity in the same clothes, basically. From the attacker side point of view, of course, this is just uh, the same old, same old kind of uh, cat and mouse game that I have been witnessing for the last 30 years. Now, there is some new technology like AI that is uh, going to help the other side, but the same technology in a different clothes is going to help on our side. So we are just kind of competing and making ourselves better and better. The main question is that how do we build that AI capability in the protection side and training side to be part of the defense, be part of the kind of the human psychology, uh, in, in enhancing the psychological features of human beings, of, of uh, being capable of detecting the most sophisticated attacks, for example. Uh, so that's on my opinion where it really is, is kind of uh, where the key, key focus should be. Okay. Thank you. Maxime, the future yeah, of social engineering. The, the elephant in the room is uh, AI, and, and so we can wonder about how much uh, generative AI is going to be used in the future, uh, both to improve phishing emails in terms of content and grammar, but also to translate them. Uh, ChatGPT is really good to translate in certain languages with the right prompts, uh, and even better maybe to target phishing emails. So if you input 
you know, some information about the person that you're targeting, ChatGPT or any generative AI model. They can help you to have a, an email that would be more impactful, more, more likely to cause a click. Whatever the tool that we use, even if, you know, generative AI is used to make more advanced attacks, in the end, the tactics are the same. It's about collecting a password or it's about getting money, right? So for people, I think that, you know, it will be still the same things to look for. Maybe in a slightly more advanced format, but still looking for, you know, the society and best nation, this business email compromise where, you know, people pretend to be the CEO or pretend to uh, be a supplier changing a bank account. You know, those are the techniques that we will continue to see. Yeah, thank you for that. Really great point about that. It's a force, my, force, force multiplier effect. Mm. What this is, it's uh, not necessarily some kind of a living, breathing thing that's coming out there and attacking us, but it's helping the attackers do what they do better. Okay, Jessica, the future of yeah. social engineering. I would build really on, on what Petri and Maxime have said. I think they've both made really good points around this. AI, of course, is the, is the hot topic. It's what we're all concerned about and also what we're all looking to, thinking how can we use this in terms of defense. So no surprise, it's been the number one um, topic of the awareness sessions I've been running this month. And really what, what I focus on when I raise awareness of this is the importance of critical thinking, which is, has always been really important when it comes to whether we're being manipulated and spotting social engineering. But for me, this becomes even more valuable and even more crucial when it comes to um, AI and how AI can be used, for example, in terms of deep fakes. So as you say, it's really about that force multiplier, the fact that we are going to see more sophisticated phishing coming through increasingly with AI. We're going to see more convincing deep fake. And so it's about having that mindset being able to spot if something is unexpected, if it makes you feel something and if it asks you to do something and knowing that those are the red flags where it's really important to step back to recognize that you may be being pushed into your judgment being clouded, whatever format that comes in, whatever technology that uses, however sophisticated it looks. For me, it's about building up that critical thinking and helping people realize, yes, there are the technical tools in place and that's fantastic. But cyber criminals are always going to find those ways around them. And so as people, we need to recognize, have I expected to receive this? Is it making me feel something? Is it asking me to do something? Therefore, I need to go and check with the supposed sender via another means to verify, is this real? Critical thinking is a muscle. And when you develop that muscle, it seems like it's really going to protect you even with very sophisticated attacks. Uh, yeah, great points. Okay, everybody, I've really appreciated this session. I've learned a lot. I'm sure the audience will learn a lot. So thank you all. And let's go to the next phase of the webinar series.